right then, and more of his thought, of course, is expressed in uh, his key books. So if you could briefly go over uh, his three, uh, three principal books, Moral Man, The Children of Light, and The Irony of American History, just brief overviews of those. Okay, so Moral Man and Immoral Society was written in 1932. Um, this is just a couple of years after the Great Depression hit. Uh, so Niebuhr's watching, you know, the people that were making factories hum now forming queues at bread lines. And there's this humiliation and desperation that comes with that. Um, he watched the grand projects of the social gospel crumble with the economic crash as well. Um, you know, he saw the flare up of, you know, there's this, this, all these class tensions and these race tensions that really begin to simmer under the surface, uh, you know, during the era of the Great Depression. And um, so he basically starts asking the question, you know, what does it mean to try to enact any good in politics under circumstances such as these? And the basic conclusion that he, the basic premise of that book is, yes, individuals are capable of being remarkably good, right? We can be really good to our friends and our families and our loved ones. Uh, we tend to be good to people that we identify as part of our group, right? If we pass the same homeless person on the way to work every day, chances are at some point we're going to feel compassion and start giving them money and maybe do so on a more regular basis, right? But when it comes to, you know, helping somebody struggling at, say, the U.S.-Mexico border, <laughs> we don't feel that same personal tie with them. So we're a lot less likely to do anything to help them out. In fact, our tendency is going to be to try to hold our resources for people who are in our own group. And that's where the selfishness of groups comes in, where he talks about the immorality of the group and the potential immorality of society. And part of what that was for him was a mechanism for explaining, you know, you and I, we, we all know wonderful people um, who, when you look at the way that they align their politics in terms of groups, feel real animus against people on the other side, right? To put it in very simple language, it's it's kind of like, let's say you um, meet somebody at a dinner party, you hit it off with them. Um, after establishing a personal connection, you find out that they're fans of your opposing sports team, right? Chances are, once you've established that sense of connection, you'll rid each other about it, but you're fine, right? You'll work past the fact that you cheer for different teams. Now, let's say those two same people were wearing their team's colors at a rivalry game and they bumped into each other, you know, in a walkway in the stadium, they might get into a fight because in that moment, the only way they're seeing each other is through their group affiliation. They're not seeing each other as individuals. Right. So that's one, another way of explaining the divide between moral humans and immoral society. And so Niebuhr's conclusion at the end of that book is um, if we want... Um, to enact actual justice in society, we're going to have to make our peace with how to coerce groups into doing the right thing, right, when they don't want to, and do so nonviolently, right? He, he really wanted to hold on. He talked about elections as, you know, ways that we manage coercion in social circumstances. The winning party in an election gets to pass a bunch of legislation that the other side doesn't like. That's not violent, but it is a form of coercion, right? So he insisted where possible, use nonviolent means of coercion, but we need to be honest about the fact that if we're going to take all these competing groups and build some kind of justice into society, um, some groups are going to be left feeling like they got their arms twisted and that's okay. Cause that's the only way to get, you know, these groups, which are fundamentally immoral in the way that they behave as collectives um, to agree to anything that remotely resembles justice. So that's moral man and immoral society. Uh, Children of Light and Children of Darkness. Um, this is 1944. This is, you know, World War II still happening. Um, and the dilemma that Niebuhr is confronting there, I mean, so he was one of the first people to push for intervention. By 1944, he had decisively won that debate. The U.S. was full throttle into the war, and, you know, the, the economy was on war footing. Um, and he was already realizing, okay, the allies are going to win this war, but what do we do then? What kind of society to be, do we build? And what do we do with democracy? 
Because again, in retrospect, I think it's easy to take for granted that robust democracies emerged in the wake of World War II. That wasn't clear at the time, right? You had a bunch of the world either go fascist or go communist. Um, you know, right before the war, and this is before the Cold War, so we haven't had this massive confrontation with the communist bloc of the Soviet Union, but Niebuhr saw that potential confrontation looming. And so he was asking himself, how do we uh, position dem democracy as the alternative that we need to pursue between the, you know, the extreme on the left of communism and the extreme of the right of fascism? And what he ended up arguing in that book is that if we're going to do thread that needle and actually build um, workable democratic societies, we need democracies that take original sin seriously, right? That take seriously the fact that human beings are self-interested and easily deluded um, and really work on calibrating checks and balances in a way that take that reality into account. Um, because one of the things that he did with that book that I actually think was really important is he made very clear, because the, the image of the children of light and the children of darkness, um, that can sound, for, for readers of the time, it sounded really obvious. Oh, clearly the light allies are the children of light and the, you know, the Axis powers are the children of darkness and Stalin's a child of darkness, etc. But in the book itself, uh, Niebuhr argues um, that's actually not, the case. Yes, there are just a couple of children of darkness. Like he pinpointed Hitler and Stalin and Napoleon as people who were true children of darkness, who were so um, bent on pursuing their own interests that they were literally incapable of pursuit of conceiving of an ideal outside of themselves. But he said the vast majority of people who follow after them are children of light who've been deluded, right? They're capable yeah. of an ideal of pursuing an ideal that's bigger than themselves and these children of darkness have co-opted that ideal and deceived them into pursuing ends that are not good for them or anyone else and he's also clear you know on the allied side the u.s was isolationist until the 11th hour we were deluded children of light who thought we could stay out of this conflict. We told ourselves that we were doing it out of some high-flown commitment to pacifism. That wasn't what it was. It was self-interest that we were not willing to admit to ourselves. And we need to own up to our own delusions as the children of light. Um, and so to, for the children of light to stop being deluded, they need to become wise. Part of how they become wise is by learning from the children of darkness about the power of self-interest and how deep yeah. that self-interested tendency runs in all of us. So don't absorb their malice. Right. Don't weaponize self-interest the way they do. But the way that they were able to bring the world to the brink of collapse um, shows that they have a very good insight into what humans actually care about, regardless of what they think or say they care about. And that teaches us something about our own sin nature, and it will give us some tools for for dealing with that on the other end. All right. And the third one. So the irony of American history uh, comes in in 1952. Um, so at this point, you know, I, again, Niebuhr lived during an era of head spinning change. Um, on a calendar, these dates are not that far from each other, 1932, 1944, 1952. Um, but the world looks so different at each one of those dates. And in 1952, um, you know, America has emerged as the very clear, overwhelming winner of the World War II era, right? As a nuclear power, as the most prosperous, powerful country the world has ever seen. Um, and it happened in less than a decade. It was just this absolutely stunning turn of fortune. Um, and what Niebuhr ended up doing there is he, he you know, so 1932, the question was, how do we keep, you know, how do we achieve a workable justice in the face of the Great Depression? 1944, how do we rebuild an, a world that flew apart on us? 1952 is, how do we not let all this power and success and prosperity go to our head? Right? How do we keep our feet on the ground in the midst of that? And so the irony of American history was his attempt to do that. And, and basically, he talked about um 
the irony of good intention, right? The irony of America wanting to see itself as as good and righteous, <laughs> um, and you know, kind of this this you know this this on the vanguard of everything good on the world stage, and him saying like, "Listen, it's the right intention. Try to be those things, but." beware of the ways that you fall short of your own professed ideals right and he he called back on american history in this right you you know america has this image of itself as the land of the free um let's talk about how colonists treated uh native americans right Mm -hmm. this was freedom for some right but there are other people who faced a very brutal side to the american experiment right and we need to hold those things in tension, right? It, it's not that that negates our ideals. We should still keep pursuing the ideals to be the land of the free. But let's be honest about the ways we fall short. And the more glaring example, obviously, is even more glaring example is slavery, right? Three-fifths compromise, things that are baked into the very moments of founding. Again, it doesn't negate the ideal. Keep pursuing the ideal of liberty and justice for all but be honest about the ways that you fall short and have continued to fall short right up to the 1950s. This is still the era of Jim Crow. Right. And so trying to get America to kind of thread that needle of keep holding your ideals, keep championing them, um, keep pushing for them. But when, you know, the Soviet Union says that you're not living up to them, don't dismiss them out of hand. They might be onto something. And listen to the critique, right? It might be done out of malice. It might be done to try to embarrass you, whatever else. But if there is a grain of truth in it, listen to it. And, you know, finally, he uses the motif of, of divine laughter, where he says, you know, the, the uh, Bible talks about God laughing at the wicked. And he says, yeah, sometimes divine laughter toward humans can be scornful. Um, but other times that laughter is just, you know, ironic laughter at the clumsiness of your children, <laughs> you know? And... You know, we need to learn to laugh at ourselves as well. Let's not take ourselves too seriously. Because he, he does this observation about humor and says, um, when we laugh at ourselves, right, when somebody's poking fun at us and we can laugh, it's because we realize that they are actually pointing out something that's ridiculous, right? Something that we're doing that doesn't, it's incongruent. It doesn't fit with our self-perception. And when we can laugh, it's actually healthy because we can own it. We're not taking ourselves too seriously. And then we can start maybe fixing that thing that we're doing that might be a little bit ridiculous and that we need to learn to do that as our nation, right? We need to laugh at ourselves, learn to laugh at ourselves a bit and not take ourselves too seriously. And that in not taking ourselves too seriously, maybe we'll find some grace and find some repentance and find a way forward. Please check out more videos from The Charge. Don't forget to click on like and hit the subscribe button.